33 years ago, astronomers knew of precisely zero exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than our sun. The vast majority of astronomers assume they're out there, it's just that they were too difficult for us to detect. Flash forward to today, and over 5,000 exoplanets have been revealed, and we now know that at least half of all normal stars have planets. Exoplanetary science is now one of, if not the dominant field of astronomical research, chewing up large fractions of astronomy research funding, telescope time, and graduate students looking to make their mark. Here's a question though, why did we do it? A cynic might say that if you already believe that these exoplanets are out there, then what was the point in looking for them? And whenever I talk about the search for exomoons, moons around these planets, there are always a few comments like that here too. So far, we have zero confirmed exomoons and just two candidates that my team have identified. But like exoplanets, we have overwhelming confidence that they must surely exist out there. So does that mean that there's no point in looking? By the same logic, then perhaps there's no point in looking for extraterrestrial life either, or indeed a multitude of other hypothesized phenomena. Hopefully though, you've already come up with some pretty good reasons in your head as to why this argument doesn't really hold water. The fruit of the past 33 years of exoplanet discovery was not really their existential confirmation. If that was so, then we would have stopped after the first. No, the fruit was seeing what other planetary systems were like. How do they resemble our own? How are they different? How common are other planets? And are there types of planets out there which look nothing like the ones in our own solar system? Put simply, it was and continues to be a project of sheer curiosity about other worlds. And how enriching that journey has been. Revealing planets in unexpected places like dead stars, giant stars, and binary stars, as well as diverse flavors, like super-Earths, hot Jupiters, mini-Neptunes, lava worlds, and ultra-eccentric planets. So why look for exomoons? It is not to merely confirm their existence, but rather it is to reveal the rich treasures which they will surely reveal to us. The moons in our own solar system are already staggeringly diverse. Just imagine what exomoons might behold. After all, who could have predicted the transformative impact that exoplanets have had on the entire field of astronomy, let alone NASA and even public discourse about science? The truth is that exomoons would represent an entirely new type of astronomical object, and the potential rewards from their discovery are frankly incalculable at this point. So that's my reason number one as to why we must find exomoons. But that's not very specific, and it could equally be applied to many of the potential discoveries too. So let's walk through four other reasons, much more specific, as to why looking for exomoons is, in my opinion, essential. Reason number two, Pandoras. Anyone who's even remotely aware of science fiction stories will surely be familiar with the trope of a habitable moon. Probably the most famous example these days is Pandora, the habitable exomoon depicted in James Cameron's Avatar series, so is this just sci-fi or is it genuinely possible? Essentially, these are Earth-like planets in every way except for the fact that they orbit a gas giant, so yes, by construction, such a moon would almost certainly be habitable. One concern though, might be if the moons get too close to the gas giant, since we know that Jupiter has intense radiation belts that bathe its innermost moons in showers of energetic particles. For example, the innermost moon Io receives 3600 REM, which is about five times the lethal dose for humans. But this radiation level drops off precipitously at wider orbits, and in fact Callisto receives less radiation than the Earth does. So I don't think this is really a showstopper, and in fact, I think that exomoons might have habitability advantages over their planetary brethren. We often assume that habitable worlds need a magnetosphere to protect them from harmful charged particles and cosmic radiations, but moons can actually borrow the field from their planet. As moons orbit behind their planet, they pass inside the planetary magnetosphere and thus can enjoy shielding for up to half their orbit despite having no magnetic field themselves. A second advantage that moons have is that we do not expect them to get tightly locked to their stars. 
The most common stars in the universe are diminutive red dwarfs, for which the temperate zone is so close in that any planets residing within it would surely become tightly locked to their host star. This means that one side of the planet is always facing the star, there's no day or night cycle. A possible danger of this is that the night side of the planet could get so cold that the atmosphere freezes solid. Then the day side atmosphere rushes around, it too gets cold and freezes, soon leading to total atmospheric collapse. Moons would actually have no such issue here though, for if that planet had a moon, the moon would eventually tightly lock to the planet, not the star. That means that both sides of the moon would receive equal amounts of radiation still. So sorry Pink Floyd, there's no such thing as the dark side of a moon, but there is such a thing as the dark side to some exoplanets. So hopefully it's clear that moons appear totally viable as habitable worlds, and we've not even discussed the possibility of subsurface ocean worlds like Europa or Enceladus, adding a whole other dimension to this discussion. So let me just better articulate reason two just to summarize. One of NASA's overarching mission goals is to determine the frequency of habitable worlds around other stars. Indeed, that was explicitly the goal of NASA's Kepler mission, which unfortunately it failed to accomplish for reasons we discussed in a previous video. But regardless, this remains a central goal for NASA because it informs, in fact, I would even say it dictates the design requirements of their future missions. Because here's the thing, if we ever want to take a photo of a nearby Earth-like world, then the size of that telescope is going to depend on how close the nearest Earth is, and that will obviously depend on how common Earths are in general. So this isn't some cute academic question, this has fundamental engineering and design consequences. So I would claim this. Any effort to calculate the frequency of Earth-like worlds in the cosmos cannot ignore the potential contribution of exomoons. If habitable moons are out there, they could well make up a large slice of the pie, and perhaps even be the most common type of living world in the universe. By the way, you might notice that my setup is a little bit different today, thanks to my new beautiful desk that has been supplied by Flexispot, the sponsor of today's video. We all know that standing desks are better for our backs, but if you're like me, you don't want to stand all day, sometimes you want to sit as well. I had a hand cranked adjustable desk before, but truthfully, I could just never be bothered to crank it up and I ended up just sitting there all day feeling pain in my back. Also, the desk was really wobbly and in fact this caused a problem during a recent interview on live television when you could see the camera just kind of bouncing around as I leaned on the desk. So when Flexispot offered to send me one of their electric standing desks, I was really excited to try it out. The desks come in a range of sizes and finishes, with a cable management system below and integrated single and dual display stands available too. I went for the 60 inch dark bamboo with black metal frame. It was a breeze to put together, the surface is beautiful and the whole thing feels incredibly sturdy, no more shaky cameras. Plus, best of all, I mean, just check this out. <laughs> Incredibly responsive. I really have no excuse not to use this as a standing desk anymore, and my back is thankful for that. So do your back a favor and check out my link and promo code down below in the description. In fact, during their anniversary sale until the 9th of September, you can get up to 60% off when you purchase the E7 desk and the C7 chair. So thanks to Flexispot for supporting us today. Next, reason number three, the rare earth hypothesis. This is a topic which, again, we have discussed in detail in a previous video, but to summarize, Ward and Brownlee propose that the earth might be incredibly unusual in having the right conditions for a civilization such as ourselves. Most relevantly, one of the key arguments concerns our moon. Now, you may not know that our moon is kind of weird. It's 1.2% the mass of our planet, which is actually the largest mass ratio for any planet in the solar system, unless you count Pluto as a planet. That freakishly large moon is suggested to be vital to our very existence because of three reasons. First, the large mass stabilizes Earth's obliquity against Jupiter's influence, thus giving us a stable climate. Second, the moon is thought to have formed through a giant impact which could have stripped off much of the Earth's original lithosphere. Without this impact, the lithosphere may well have been so thick that it formed a so-called stagnant lid, 
devoid of any plate tectonics, much like Venus. And of course, no plate tectonics means no carbon cycle, which would be a very big problem for life as we know it. Finally, after the impact, the moon would have coalesced just a couple of Earth radii away from us, leading to huge continent-covering tides, entire land masses covered in rock pools, which may well have been the birthplace for life. As you can see, these arguments are somewhat speculative, and that's why the rare earth hypothesis remains a controversial view. However, I don't think there can be any doubt that the moon has clearly played an influential role in the earth's formation and evolution. So on that basis, I think it's fair to say that when we detect the first earth twin, one of the very first questions we will want to ask is, does it have a moon twin? And this brings us neatly to reason number four, why we need to find moons. How the hell do moons form anyway? You might think we have some pretty good answers about this, and indeed I could give you some, but remember that 33 years ago, we thought that we had figured out planet formation too, and just look what happened there. We looked at the planets in our backyard and we came up with this detailed, intricate model explaining their origins, evolution, and even the exceptions. Giant planets form beyond the ice line, Mars gets truncated by Jupiter's migration, Neptune flings out Kuiper Belt objects, and so on. It was all fairly neatly tied up. But exoplanets just blew all of those expectations out of the window. The Copernican principle was broken. Hot Jupiters most famously exemplify this, because back then, essentially no theories predicted their existence, and still today, they remain a puzzling phenomena to explain. And in the same way, exomoons hold enormous promise to teach us how satellites form. As an example, for moons co-forming around gas giants, we expect tiny moons, no bigger than one ten thousandth the mass of the host planet. But critically, does this rule really hold elsewhere? And then we have the weirdos, most notably our own moon, which is thought to have formed through a giant impact. And that raises the question, how often does that happen? Is that a rare, improbable circumstance? Or is it the inevitable outcome of terrestrial planet formation? With just one data point, there's no way to tell. So the truth is that if we want to understand our uniqueness and our origins, then we have to find other moons. And finally, reason number five, a real spicy kicker to finish us off. In 2014, Hannah Ryan and colleagues published one of the most important exoplanet papers in the last decade, in my opinion, but one that has been massively overlooked. Playing off the title from Al Gore's infamous climate change documentary, Some Inconvenient Truths About Biosignatures, Ryan and colleagues highlight how exomoons might be absolutely central to our quest for life in the universe for a wholly practical reason. Right now. NASA and many others are trying to figure out how we could build a telescope that could take a photo of another Earth, with the current moniker being the Habitable Worlds Observatory. The idea is to build a space telescope so powerful that it could suppress the light of a star so well that the orbiting planets become visible, a contrast ratio of a staggering billion to one. For the second time in human history, we will see the pale blue glow of a habitable planet, but this time that light would be of a world other than our Earth. From that distant smudge of light, the telescope will split the light up into its constituent colors and look for the chemical fingerprints of biogenic molecules like oxygen and methane. Now that's not the only pair of molecules we could look for, check out our early video on biosignatures for more on that, but it is often considered a slam dunk combination. You see, oxygen by itself could simply be water photolysis, no life involved, and methane alone could be non-biological too, I mean, just ask Titan. But oxygen and methane don't play nice together, and they quickly react, I mean, just look at the SpaceX rockets. And this implies that something, or someone, must be actively producing them. Other pairings are possible too, but the basic idea is always the same two molecules that reside in a so-called chemical disequilibrium with one another. So here's where Ryan's paper comes in. Imagine that we had an Earth-sized ocean planet, but no life. Imagine further that this planet had a Titan-like moon with a methane-rich atmosphere. So far, so good. Now when our direct imaging telescope veers towards this target and snaps that precious photo, 
it will not see the planet and moon separately, for they are too close to one another to resolve. Instead, it would just see a single pale blue smudge of light, light that contains photons from both the planet and the moon. Splitting that light up into its constituent colors, the scientists would indeed see both oxygen and methane, the classic biosignature pair, and conclude that they had succeeded, life had finally been discovered. But they were all of them deceived, for in this story there is no life. Because remember, the oxygen was merely the product of photolysis, ultraviolet light splitting water up in the planet's atmosphere, and the methane was never part of the planet in the first place, but rather was bound to the moon. We would have been tricked by the universe, by exomoons. To me, this underscores just how crucial the question of exomoons is. We simply cannot ever hope to conduct this experiment, one which NASA will likely pour tens of billions of dollars into one day, unless we first figure out what is up with the moons. To answer these questions, we need a programmatic effort to survey and measure the occurrence rate of moons around exoplanets. How often are they out there? How big do they get? What sorts of planets typically have them, and how many? These are all questions that we can in fact currently answer today if we just tried. As many of you likely know, exomoons is a career-long passion for me, and so some of you might reasonably think that perhaps I'm being biased in this discussion here. But in this video, I just want to explain to you why it is that I have committed so much time to this question, and why I genuinely believe that these questions are paramount to the goals of the exoplanet field more broadly. In a recent video, I shared how we proposed an exomoon search with JWST that was sadly shot down, which I think is now our fifth proposal in a row decline to try this work on big space glass. JWST will not be around forever, slowly depleting its fuel and cryogen and risking electrical glitches or even asteroid impacts every second it's up there. And yet, it is unquestionably capable of delivering us these answers the first ever telescope which could find analogues to the moons in our solar system. If we don't ever try, if we never even attempt the experiment, I am convinced that we will regret that decision for years to come. So yes, as strange as it sounds, exomoons really do matter, and I suspect in a much more profound way than many of you would have guessed before watching this video. So hopefully together we can make it happen and open up a new window into the cosmos. So as always, stay thoughtful and stay curious.